Hey everybody, I hope you can hear me okay. Had to reboot a couple of times. Hope you, uh, hope the audio is working okay now. Great to see you all, hello. I see a couple of you. So how long does it take us to heal, right? This is a live stream, welcome to live Q&A. Welcome, this is the global community for adult survivors of complex trauma all forms of complex PTSD, all forms of trauma in the form of abuse. So uh, this isn't a place for crisis care, never a place for crisis care. Uh, we have amazing interns and moderators over in the chat box, either here or down there, somewhere around here, that are putting up information for you to get the crisis care that you deserve, get the crisis care that, that, that you need and that you deserve, right? This is a place for us to come hang out, get our questions answered. And we've been doing this now for over four years. You guys have been showing up for over four years. And if you're brand new here, we're super excited that you're here. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I had a book over on my bookshelf that I was going to, um, to share with you guys. So I'll be back one second. This is an amazing book. I know I've talked about this book several times on this channel, uh, but if your trauma began in childhood, or maybe you're not even sure if your trauma began in childhood, your life is just not where you want it to be. Maybe your relationships are strained. Maybe your relationship with your children is not what you would want for it to be. Maybe your, uh, your relationship with your with your spouse or your partner is not what you would want it to be. Maybe you're struggling at work and you want better relationships with your coworkers or your boss or just your friends. And you are just not sure if maybe your trauma began in childhood or not. I mean, your childhood seemed okay, but you're really not sure. This is an amazing book for you. Um, it's called Childhood Disrupted. And Donna Jackson Nakazawa, um, she's actually one of the women that's over on ACES Connection. It's a website for anyone who has experienced adver adverse childhood experiences, or if you're familiar with the ACES study, which was done by Vincent Felitti and Bruce Perry um, back in, gosh, I want to say it was like the 80s or the 90s. Um, excellent book for you, if, if that is you. Um, and then, of course, somewhere around here on my crazy, messy desk, like here you see candles and awesome, you know, cleanliness. But like here is that you don't see what really goes on. Let's just let's just put it that way. So um, so there's a lot. I don't know where my I don't know where my grief recovery handbook is, but the grief recovery handbook is is very, very, very helpful. But I just want to answer your guys's questions. Right. I just want to answer your questions regarding how long it takes to heal complex trauma or CPTSD symptoms. Um, interestingly, if you type in the letters C, P, T, S, D, and then you double click those letters and then you right click on them and you touch the little button that says look up, it will take you to Wikipedia and it will tell you all about complex trauma or developmental trauma. And that is that is huge. That is huge in the climate that we're living in today. Um, classic post-traumatic stress disorder differs from complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And the diagnostic 
and, Statist and Statistical Manual, fifth edition, here in the United States, and a lot of other countries actually defer to it also, does not include an actual mental illness diagnoses for complex PTSD. However, I'm holding out hope for the sixth edition of the DSM. So um, that may or may not happen, and that's fine. The, the ICD-11, which is respected and used in other countries, does have a CPTSD diagnosis in it and validates a lot of people's human experience. And it's just, it's wonderful to see. I think um, we shared, I'm not sure if it was here or on one of our daily calls, if we shared... There's a quote by Bessel van der Kolk and Bruce Perry. They submitted a sample to the statisticians and the you know big companies that are involved in the content that goes into the diagnostic and statistical manuals. And they submitted a, a, a research study with, and their sample size was 200,000. And they were wanting attachment trauma and attachment disorder to be included because as you will see in this amazing book, trauma be can begin in utero and it can be in your early, early, early years from infancy on. And depending on when your trauma began is going to answer the question more accurately, how long does it take to heal? So I don't want you to lose hope, and I and I definitely don't want you to feel as though there is a Band-Aid approach to anything I'm sharing here. I'm going to answer your questions from a trauma-informed perspective, meaning that I always need to put my phone down whenever I discuss this. So let's say here's your trauma over here. This may have happened in utero or in infancy, pre-verbal trauma. It could have been neglect. It could be overt abuse of, of, any, of any kind. And then let's say here's you now. So this is a long time ago and this is you now, right? And if you'll notice, my hand looks much bigger. Even though my hands are the same size, my hand looks much bigger here, like up close. Like let's say this is present day symptoms that you're dealing with now coping strategies that you have now. And here's some trauma that happened a long time ago, pre-verbal, infancy, developmental trauma. And it could have been going on for years and years and years and years and years. Well, a lot of times what we see here, which looks a lot bigger, is financial troubles, trouble keeping a job, our our home life is is less than satisfying our relationship with our children our relationship with our siblings our our friendships this is what we see now um, perhaps we are on social media a lot more than we would like to be perhaps we have um, some numbing stuffing and avoiding that's going on and we don't realize it's connected to what's going on back here so maybe we drink alcohol in excess. Maybe we use recreational drugs. Maybe we use prescription medications. Maybe we're on social media. Maybe we're shopping more than we would want to be shopping, spending money that we don't have, you know, have to spend. Maybe there's um, a, a porn addiction. Maybe there is a, a gaming, video game type addiction. Anything where you're numbing, stuffing, or avoiding and checking out from reality. Maybe you're gambling. Um, drugs, alcohol, any type of, maybe it's adrenaline, maybe you're an adrenaline junkie, right? And you don't realize that maybe it could have to do with stuff that went on back here. You just are like, this is who I am. This is who I am. But the two might be connected. They might be connected. It's a possibility. It's, it might be healthy to consider the possibilities, right? We could consider the possibilities. And if we do decide to consider the possibilities, then that means that we're open to growth. It means that we're considering that we have room to grow and that there are books we can read or communities that we can get involved in. Um, one of the conversations I had in this past week was with one of the women over at ACES Connection. And she's actually in charge of the entire um, West Coast, Pacific Northwest, and she's also in charge of Hawaii. Well, 
ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, is something that not a lot of people take into consideration. It's it's not really fringe. It's not really fringe psychology um, as much as you know, there's a lot of sensationalism that goes on around like narcissistic abuse and other types of abuse, but adverse childhood experiences, then that sort of implicates someone, right? Then that sort of like knocks on the door of maybe like a family experience or people who were trusted to the family. And so it's a little bit more taboo and a little bit more fringe. However, what I learned from this wonderful gal, Karen, that I spoke with this week is once people learn about ACEs, if you can remember back to the time, maybe it was here on this channel three, four years ago, whenever it might have been when you first learned about adverse childhood experiences and the study that was done on adverse childhood experiences and the different categories of adverse childhood experiences, right? What Karen was sharing with me this week is once you learn about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and the de devastating effects in childhood that stay with you into adulthood, once you learn about them, you can't unlearn them. And so the reason I mention all of this stuff, gosh, Athena, why are you talking so much about childhood? All I want to know is how I can get rid of my emotional flashbacks. All I want to know is how I can get rid of these complex trauma, this, all these complex PTSD symptoms. I'm so sick of how it's showing up in my life. I don't think I deserve any healthy relationships. I don't feel loved and cared for. I feel very alone even when I'm in a room full of people. I'm not sure why I struggle to organize my day and stay on top of my calendar? Why is it that I get overwhelmed with, with just everything in life? Why do I feel like hiding under the bed covers most of the time? Why do I isolate? Why don't I like to leave my house? Why have I all of a sudden developed some sort of social anxiety? It's really, really odd. It's like I used to love social situations. What's the deal, Athena? How come I'm struggling to balance my checkbook? How come I've been going from job to job to job and I never seem to follow things through to completion? How come every relationship I have in my life is not one that I'm enjoying? When am I going to be able to enjoy relationships? When am I not going to feel alone? When am I going to feel safe in my body, Athena? When am I going to feel seen and heard and feel okay with that? Not only do I want to be seen and heard and accepted for who I am and loved, but when is that going to happen and why does it scare me? Why am I afraid to heal, Athena? I really do want to heal. But then as soon as I take steps toward healing, it's like I sabotage it. And then all of a sudden I don't want to heal anymore. What's going on with that, Athena? Why, 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 why? Well, the reason that I'm mentioning books like Childhood Disrupted and the Grief Recovery Handbook and the two books that I talk about a lot, which are Boundaries and Safe People by Townsend and Cloud. And then there's the other one I talk about a lot, which is um, Love is a Choice by Minerth and Meyer. And then there's um, another one. Gosh, what is that other one? Oh, my goodness. I talk about it a lot. Now I'm drawing a blank. But the reason I talk about these types of books is because we may not even realize that some of the patterns we have in our life present day actually started in childhood. And we didn't realize that things that we were dealing with in childhood were not things that were necessarily healthy. Because when you're raised in an environment, you don't realize that your environment is abusive it's just life. It's not trauma. It's not dysfunctional. It's it's just life. Like all you know is all you know, right? So all those questions and all those things that you might be thinking of, it's okay to think about those things. It's actually really, really, really good that you're thinking about those things. I'm so glad that you guys have chosen to spend some time here tonight. Now, the videos that I share on, on this channel um, are most of them right now are Q&A videos where they're live streams. I show up and I answer your guys' questions the way I am doing tonight. Um, there are still people that show up on the channel and that say stuff like, wow, why do you talk so much? Why do you, why do you talk about so much stuff? Why can't um, you just like make five minute videos like everybody else? Why are your videos so long? I'm, I, I don't feel that you're being respectful of my time. Um, 
And the answer to that is I haven't really had the wherewithal to pre-record and curate videos for this channel for a really long time. Um, but I'm going to be doing that. It's just taken me a while to get into that groove. I really enjoy showing up here every single week with you guys like I have been for four years. And I'm finding new ways to sort of show up and serve this community that aren't the long Q&A live streams. So be on the lookout for stuff like that and be on the lookout for other exciting things that are going on. Um, I started a foundation for trauma survivors and um, we have a book club that is starting up in another few weeks. You can go to healingbookclub.com. I think it, the site might be, might be ready and it might not be ready. So, um, but you can go to cptsdfoundation.org and you can look for a link that says um, healing book club. And then there's also um, a cruise for the healing community and the practitioners in the healing community, the survivors in the healing community that's coming up in less than a year, putting that together. And then, of course, we have the daily calls. So if you want to get plugged into free support groups um, or you would like to have daily live calls, which are not free, but they're affordable, it's affordable care and it's peer support and it's trauma informed and it's a safe community, then just go to dailyrecoverysupport.com and then click around and just look around at what it is that's going on. And there's a button there for free support groups. And all you do is just fill out the form and then someone will contact you. Every person is personally vetted. Um, but I want you guys to know that I haven't found a way to heal that doesn't involve other people. So I'm talking about all of this stuff in the order that I'm talking about it for a reason. When we choose to become vulnerable and hang out with other people the way that we do here on a weekly basis, the way we do on our daily, daily recovery support calls where we have discussions like this every single day, 365 days a year, the way that we show up in the free groups where everybody just sort of, you know, checks out and, and, you know, supports one another over on Facebook. Um, that's free. The daily calls are not free, but when we do those things with other people that aids in our healing journey and it actually helps us heal faster because healing to just as this is, this is important. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Just as your abuse didn't happen in a vacuum. You didn't abuse yourself. You were abused by another person. Therefore, the parts of you that were abused that need to heal cannot heal in a vacuum by yourself. You're going to need to heal around other people, not people who are predatory and abusive. So interpersonal trauma requires interpersonal healing. Um, trauma that happens as a result of a natural disaster, like let's say a tornado or a hurricane or a flood, that type of trauma usually will be something that you can heal from for the most part by self-help, reading. I do recommend meeting with a trauma-informed therapist, trauma-informed practitioner, of some sort, whether it's a licensed clinician or a therapist or a counselor, maybe a coach, I do recommend that. But especially if your trauma happened within the context of another person, in relationship with another person, it's going to require healing with other people. And it can take quite a long time depending on when your trauma happened and for how long your trauma went on for. So I'll just give you a great example. And then I really want to answer your guys' questions. We're right at half past the hour. So questions are closed for the night. I'm going to answer as many of these questions as I possibly can tonight. And what, I'm, what I really want you guys to understand and know is that let's just say the example I give you, there's two examples. And I have a client, for instance, where she was raised in a good enough family as per Pete Walker, good enough family, right? And, you know, supportive, helpful parents. You know, she had a great relationship with her, with her siblings, her two siblings. And 
her father died unexpectedly when she was 17 years old. And at that time, her mom went into a deep depression and the responsibility for the family was resting solely on the shoulders of, of my client. And when you're 17 years old, you have choices to make. You have um, college acceptance letters and you have scholarships and you have hopes and dreams and things that you're looking forward to in life. And your world is crumbling down around you. You've just lost one of your parents. And now this other parent who spent 17 years of your life raising you and nurturing you in a good enough environment, right? Loving, caring, and kind. You're, you're faced with a choice. Do I put my plans on hold? Or do I go in the direction of my dreams <laughs> as per Ralph Waldo Emerson, right? I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson that, that said that, go, go forth in the direction of your dreams. So let's say this particular person who happens to be a client, let's say they choose to stay with their family of origin and help their mom get through this really, really difficult time since her father had passed away, right? Let's just say that that's what she chooses to do. Let's say the mom turns to drugs and alcohol and um, falls into a deep depression and is living with mental illness and the environment around the home for the next 5, 10, 15 years becomes extremely abusive and toxic. And if you're like my client, you've stayed there and you've taken it upon yourself to make sure everybody's taken care of. You've taken it upon yourself to make sure everything goes the way it needs to go and everybody gets the proper level of care that they need. Well, that's trauma and that's complex trauma. That's ongoing trauma, ongoing abuse, and it affects our psyche. And then in, in addition to all that, when you try to speak up and use your voice, you're told that, well, at least you didn't lose your spouse, right? At least you didn't lose your husband. Um, so you couldn't possibly understand what it is that I'm going through. And so this type of history revision, this type of gaslighting, this type of abuse, this type of minimization of your human experience, these things are ex not only extremely painful, but they cause lasting trauma to our brains. Now, that type of complex trauma and the CPTSD symptoms that this person might be experiencing, such as emotional flashbacks and fear and self-loathing and feelings of guilt and horror and terror and social anxiety and agoraphobia and perhaps weight gain and all a slew of other symptoms and just the level of hypervigilance and she feels unsafe in her body and she doesn't feel seen or heard or loved or accepted. And she just wants to feel safe. And she just doesn't want to feel alone and in so much pain. That type of complex trauma with the proper trauma-informed care, with a trauma-informed practitioner, that can be healed, I believe, with the proper care within the course of maybe a year, depending on the situation and if she's willing and able to establish and maintain some extremely healthy boundaries within the context of her family of origin that may be showing up as very toxic. It's going to really depend on the health of her boundaries, the consistency of her boundaries, and how many safe relationships she's able to cultivate and maintain and nurture and the level of self-care that she's able to participate in. Okay. Those things are all going to come into play and it can happen with dedication. And like, like Richard Grennan says, you know, rep it out, rep it out, rep it out. The repetition, the repetition and the consistency is going to be key. You know, the emotional, 
intelligence, the emotional literacy, what it is that you're feeling, getting in touch with those feelings, grieving what you wish was different, sitting with those painful feelings, not numbing, stuffing and avoiding. Um, we're going to silence that inner critic that tells her that, you know, she's a horrible daughter if she leaves. Um, only good daughters stay and take care of the family because that's what any good daughter would do. So not only is it going to be establishing and maintaining extremely healthy boundaries within the context of herself and with her family of origin, but it's going to be the consistency of which that she takes care of herself, the level of self-care and how consistent she can be in naming those feelings that she's having and what feelings are underneath those feelings, how deep she can go and addressing those inner voices in her head that tell her that she's a horrible person. She's horrible at her job. She's a bad mother. She's a bad friend. She's a bad daughter. She's a bad sister. Um, she's a bad aunt. She's, she's a bad neighbor. She's, she's a bad employee. Um, she can't do anything right. Why can't she just fill in the blank, right? All these voices. She's going to need to address those and she's going to need to really be consistent in her in her self-care and in her boundaries and very consistent in keeping all of the toxic people out of her life. All of them, like every single one of them, every one of them, family of origin, neighbors, brothers, sister, cousins, aunts, uncles, boss, co-workers, all of it, right? Because we have when we go through trauma, it changes our entire worldview. And we have trouble coming back out of that. So that can, I believe, happen within the context of about a year, depending on the repetition and the consistency. Let's look at something completely different. Let's say, and then once I give you the, the second example, so that we have example A and example B, Example A is someone who didn't have necessarily attachment trauma or early childhood trauma, trauma in utero, developmental trauma, um, you know, in those early formative years. Remember, in example A, she was raised in a good enough home with a good enough family and felt safe and loved and approved of and seen and heard and cared for. And all of her basic needs were met for the first 17 years of her life. So her personality was already formed. Okay. In example B, we have a similar situation in that the trauma was within the context of the family of origin, but the trauma began with an unexpected preg pregnancy. She was a baby that wasn't planned, and so her mother was using drugs and alcohol, uh, recreational drugs, smoked marijuana on occasion, smoked cigarettes and drank alcohol throughout the pregnancy. Um, the father was, you know, her father um, married the mother, but was really absentee and didn't show up a lot and wasn't really a consistent figure. And so there were some financial issues and there were, you know, other brothers and sisters in the home that perhaps were older, maybe five, 10, 15 years older. And so she wasn't planned. And so there's already this sort of stress that sort of came on without her knowing it, because obviously she's in utero. And so the pregnancy um, is a little bit stressful or a lot stressful, depending on the environmental factors that we just discussed, the level of stress that the mother's under, the absenteeism of the father. Um, let's say when the baby is born, there's not a lot of time spent one-on-one -on -one with example B, number two, the, the person that has endured complex trauma earlier on in utero, perhaps attachment trauma, developmental trauma. So the first 17 years of her life are vastly different than example A. Um, she doesn't feel safe in her own body. She doesn't have anyone to spend time with her. She doesn't have healthy role models. Her, her basic needs are not met. There's not an abundance of love and acceptance and approval and attention and eye contact lighting up those mirror neurons. And there's not a, a tremendous feeling of safety. And she doesn't know what it's like to love herself and trust herself and learn how to brush her teeth, learn how to earn an allowance and uh, learn how to just be a kid, just get to be a kid and play, right? Play is very important. Just playing, right? Playing with other kids, learning how to socialize with other children, learning how to 
uh, build things and be proud of yourself and learning how to move things from one hand to the next, learning how to draw, learning your colors and your shapes and your numbers and your letters and learning how to read and write and speak and have your artwork from, from school put up on the refrigerator. And, you know, those are things that children need in order to develop a healthy sense of self. And so if example A, that person had that all the way up until she was 17 years old, she already had a sense of self. But the person in example B didn't have any of that. And so she is not only dealing with CPTSD symptoms present day here, but back here, she's dealing with unsafety, hypervigilance, unsure of who she is. She doesn't have a lot of love, acceptance, safety, approval, connection. How do I brush my teeth? How do I get dressed? How do I do chores? How do I learn the value of, of saving and money and allowance and interacting with other people, right? Um, this person, this little person that's forming is really flailing and really struggling. So by the time she gets to be the sage where she's got all these maladaptive coping strategies where she's numbing, stuffing, and avoiding, and she's really, really struggling. She might definitely see, wow, the two might be connected, you know, because she really realizes that, you know, what happened a long time ago can definitely affect us now. So that's one of the benefits that the person in example B has is that she can see the connection, right? wow, I'm struggling now, but then again, I've sort of always been struggling, so that makes sense. Whereas someone who grew up in a good enough home with a good enough family, and they're really struggling and they're living with CPTSD symptoms, perhaps they've fallen into an abusive relationship and they're just not really sure what's going on. They're like, I come from a good family, like what's my problem? I must be doing something wrong. Something must be wrong with me because I was raised right. Like what's the deal? What is my problem? I am such a screw up. And so sometimes it can take the person in example a a little bit longer to realize oh my gosh there must be a root cause to all of this there could be a root cause to all of this oh my goodness the root cause could be childhood stuff like it takes the person in example a a long time to actually realize that okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to i'm going to read some of your questions um let's see here I'm going to read your questions and I'm going to do my best to answer your questions. And healingbookclub.com is active. Yay. So if you want to, if you're interested in the book club, then please, by all means, check it out. We, will, we look forward to having you there. It's going to be amazing. So I want to say thank you to Willow. I want to say thank you to Hunter and Vi and Desi Pink, and Nexus, and Holistic Recovery, and John Harvey, and Joey, and thank you. Thanks for sending in your questions. I'm going to just sit back here, if I may. Put my feet up. Oh, this is great. All right. Shall we? Now that I'm comfy. Joey says, do you like my candle? Can you see my candle? I, may, I wanted to make sure my hair wasn't like near my candle. I'm like, it's pretty cool, huh? I got it at Walgreens. It's scented. It smells really nice. I got a candle as a gift from one of you guys, by the way. It smells like campfire. Very special. Thank you. You know who you are. So Joey says, how long does it take to heal to be able to feel loved? I have been on the healing journey for three and a half years, and I sometimes don't feel loved at all. I know that sounds crazy, but I feel alone sometimes, and I just want to feel loved. It doesn't sound crazy at all, Joey. I, on the contrary, it doesn't sound crazy at all. You've been through a lot, and if I'm not mistaken, Joey, I've had the privilege of getting to know you. A little bit over the years. In fact, our little mascot, our little bear right there is from you. Um, you know, 
you are someone that has been through a lot. You probably identify closely, um, identify more with example B, where your trauma happened early on, really, really, really early on. And so similarly, similar to example A, we will need to establish and maintain very healthy boundaries with 100% of the toxic people in our lives. And then in addition to that, we're going to need to develop safe relationships and we're going to need to do these things consistently because what happens then, our subconscious begins to feel safe and our level of hypervigilance goes down and then we show up differently in the world when our hypervigilance goes down. And our emotional flashbacks decrease drastically. And then when we start journaling about our feelings, I can feel the collective eye roll as I say the word journal, because I know that I talk a lot about journaling, but I, the reason I talk a lot about it is because it helps a lot. So I know it's not necessarily your guys's favorite thing for me to talk about, but journaling does help a lot. And when we journal about our feelings and we journal about how we're feeling now and what's underneath that feeling, what does this remind me of? Is there anything deeper than that? I mean, I feel this way, but what else, what else do I feel? So it's multi-pronged, Joey. In order for you to truly uh, be able to allow that love to come in, there are some things that have built up around your heart to protect you from the traumatic environment that you were raised in with the toxic individuals that had access to you. I'm talking about, um, I believe it was your brother and your mom and um, some other people in your family and your loved, your loved ones. I believe your grandma might be one of them as well. Um, there are some people in your life that are not necessarily very kind to you and they don't have your best interest in mind. And so your subconscious feels the need to keep walls up around your heart as often as possible in order for you to feel safe. And so in order for us to be able to feel loved, first we need to be able to feel safe. And the way we begin feeling safe is by establishing and maintaining very healthy boundaries and cultivating safe relationships and just consistently doing that for a really long period of time and keeping those toxic people out and reminding ourselves that the feelings we're feeling are really valid. Journaling about that, how am I feeling? What's under that feeling? I'm I'm deserving of love. And then when those voices come up in your head, those voices that tell you that you're unlovable or unwanted or that you're just you're screwing things up or that you're not a good person or that you're you're not good at anything or or whatever whatever those um voices are, are, are telling you, being able to remind yourself that those voices are lying and that those voices are not true and being able to believe that, being able to believe that because it's true that those voices are lying and they're not true, right? What they're saying is not true. So if our subconscious doesn't feel safe and we're trying to tell ourselves that we are safe, our subconscious knows the truth, they're going to say, yeah, you, you're saying that we're safe, but like this, this one scary person keeps coming around or they keep calling or these scary situations keep happening. So I don't feel safe. And so in order for us to feel loved, we first need to feel safe and we need to do all we can to create safety in our lives and really believe that we have the, the power to create safety in our lives. And that takes a lot of work. So I know you've been on this healing journey for a while, Joey, and I'm so sorry that you're not feeling loved. I have a tremendous amount of love for you and a tremendous amount of compassion for you. I've gotten the opportunity to actually speak with you over the phone. I've got, um, or rather, you know, back and forth via voice messages. And I've gotten an opportunity to, to pray for you. I've gotten an opportunity to just hold that safe space for you. And I really value you as a person and as a valued member of our community. So I hope you will be able to play this video back 
and realize that you are loved by many people here, even when the lies that your abuse is telling you are the volumes turned way up to 12, like a 12 out of 10. And the only way to turn the volume of those lies that your abuse tells you down is by creating safety and then consistently maintaining those healthy boundaries and surrounding yourself with as many safe people as possible so that your level of hypervigilance will be able to go down and you'll be able to create pockets of safety for yourself so that you can rest. And when we find rest for our soul and we're not in a constant state of hypervigilance, love, because then we relax a little bit and then there's room for love to come in. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. John Harvey says, how do you know between healing and just getting used to the symptoms of abuse? At times, I'm not sure I am healed or I've grown accustomed to this life and I'm just used to it. You know, that's a really good question, John Harvey. I think the way you know if you're healing is if you're able to receive kindness and you're able to feel fully present in your body without needing to dissociate or without inadvertently, unknowingly dissociating. I think one of the best ways to feel safe in our body is to create pockets of safety like I was just talking about with Joey. And the way we do that is by consistently establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries with 100% of the toxic people in our lives so that when we create those pockets of safety, then we can feel fully present in our bodies and we don't have to dissociate in order to feel safe. We don't have to check out um, so that we can feel safe. Because remember, when we were children, when we were children, <laughs> this isn't sponsored. It's just a book that's been really helpful for me. So when we were children, our development was disrupted by dysfunctional behaviors of others. And now that we're adults, our healing gets disrupted by dysfunctional behaviors of others. The best way to heal is to create pockets of safety so that we don't have to be hypervigilant, so that we can let love in and we can begin to trust ourselves. And the way that we begin to trust ourselves is by thinking, saying, and doing the feelings that we have. If we feel like we want to put ourselves out there and go to open mic night to watch the people sing and and do comedy and maybe, um, you know, spoken word, then that's a feeling that we have. It's a desire. And then we begin going, hmm, well, maybe I can plan for that. Maybe one of these days I'll feel safe enough to go to open mic night so that I can watch people. And then it begins to sort of, we set goals in our mind of like, well, what would need to happen in order for me to feel safe to go to open mic night? Well, I would need to feel safe in my body. And in order for me to feel safe in my body, I would need to be wearing clothes that feel really comfortable on my body. And I would want to feel safe in my vehicle or the vehicle that I go there in. And perhaps I would want to make sure that I feel protected. So maybe that would mean bringing a safe person with you or finding a way to feel safe while you're there. Um, and finding a way to, to think feel, say, and do all in congruence. That's all you're incongruent. You're congruent with yourself. You're in alignment with yourself. So you get the feeling that maybe you want to go to open mic night. You begin to think and plan about ways that you can feel safe to go to open mic night. And then you begin to talk about the fact that you're thinking about maybe going to open mic night. And then all of a sudden you go to open mic night. And so then your body realizes that you have the ability to create safety in your life, right? You have the ability to uh, to think about stuff. I have this itch, sorry. You have the ability to think about, talk about, 
and create safety in your life and follow through with the goals that you have for yourself. So that's like, that's super, super, super important. And that's not something that can happen if you're in a toxic situation, because when you're in the midst of toxicity, especially with toxic individuals that are, um, whether they're narcissistic or toxic, or um, perhaps they are predatory, then you never know how they're going to treat you. And then there's all these things sort of flying at you. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I don't feel safe. This does not feel safe. I don't know what I was thinking. Why did I do this? And so we learn to trust ourselves through healing our intuition. And the way we heal our intuition is through congruence. We, you know, we think and we say and we do and we feel everything. It's all similar. What's on the inside is the same as what's on the outside. So I hope that was helpful. I hope you guys found that helpful, that answer. I need to get a drink of water really quick because because I'm thirsty. Okay. How are you guys doing? Did I lose you? I've lost I've lost some of you. Not that many. So here we go. Holistic recovery says, I often feel like I need to just heal already to end the pain. Is this realistic for being no contact with my whole family to heal inter intergenerational trauma? Oh, yes, it's realistic. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, this is realistic. Here, I got to sit up for this one. So basically what this person, what holistic recovery is saying, trying to find my shoe, where'd my shoe go? I kicked my shoes off. There we go. Okay. So what holistic recovery is saying is I need to just heal already. Is it realistic for being no contact with my whole family to heal intergenerational trauma? And the answer is yes. I am no contact with 100% of the toxic individuals in my family of origin. And I'm low contact with those who are what uh, field mouse calls the in-betweenies. Because there are some people where you're not sure if they're unhealthy or toxic. Um, and you're not sure if they're safe. Like they're sometimes safe and then they're sometimes not as safe as you would like them to be. So they're the in-betweenies. <laughs> so I'm 100% no contact with every member of my family of origin that is predatory, abusive, or potentially sadistic, Machiavellian, sociopathic, exploitative, etc. And I am low contact with every single other family member that is sort of an in-betweeny. I only have a free open line of communication with those people in my family of origin who I have deemed to be safe, meaning that they have my best interest in mind. They are respectful of my boundaries because my boundaries are my boundaries and my healing journey is my healing journey and it's nobody else's, right? So I'm healing. I'm, I'm healing intergenerational trauma exactly the way you've described it. So it is very realistic. I too often felt like I just need to just heal already and end the pain. And I couldn't understand why it was taking so long. And what I came to understand is that I was allowing really, really toxic people to reach out to me and I could just choose to not respond. I didn't realize I needed to like block them so that they couldn't get at me, so that they couldn't suck that life out of me and suck that energy out of me. I didn't realize I needed to put healthier boundaries in place with certain people who were very toxic. I had to have more 
more checks and balances in place. I had to have healthier boundaries in place, to be quite honest. I thought my boundaries were really healthy and let's be real, they were. <laughs> but I didn't realize I needed like another layer of healthy boundaries that would keep me from being in pain. And then while I put in that other next layer of healthy boundaries, I continued with my own trauma recovery journey. And every person has their own trauma recovery journey. Mine includes trauma-informed therapy with a licensed clinician who does EMDR and we're getting ready to start somatic experiencing. And I'm gonna be driving across the island one to two hours away every single week to do neurofeedback. Why? Because everything that I just told you, hashtag neuroplasticity for the win. It's all about neuroplasticity. If I can learn it, as Richard Grannon would say, then I can effing unlearn it. <laughs> if I can learn it, I can unlearn it. So I am in the midst of not only establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries, cultivating relationships with safe people, maintaining um, no contact with 100% of the toxic people in my life, but maintaining low contact with any of the in-betweenies. But I'm also doing trauma therapy and body work and somatic experiencing and EMDR and neurofeedback. And, um, and I'm constantly looking for new ways to up my emotional intelligence I really want to be more emotionally intelligent and know what I'm feeling and what it means when I'm feeling certain things and really be in tune with my body. And then those voices that come up in my head that tell me that I'm a really shitty person and I'm a really horrible human being for needing to have healthy boundaries with toxic people. And those voices that come up in my head that tell me that I'm a horrible wife because I need to rest more than other wives rest or I don't cook as much as other wives cook, or I'm a horrible mom because I don't spend more time with my adult son who's in college and married, but yet I still have these voices that tell me I'm a shitty mom. And like, so like, it's all the things. And then we just keep trying holistic recovery. We just keep trying until we go, <sighs> this is the feeling I was looking for. Or this is really close to the feeling I was looking for. I, I have a glimpse of what it might be like to not be in so much pain. And I believe that I'm gonna reach that goal. Do not give up because you guys, yes, is this a lot of work? Everything I just said, like that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but <laughs> I'm just discovering that I'm worth it. I am worth it. I am worth the trauma therapy and the healthy boundaries and the emotional literacy drills and silencing my inner critic and reading all the books about all the things and getting ready to drive and do the neurofeedback and the EMDR and the somatic experiencing and just learning about all of this, realizing that what I went through is painful and traumatizing and it's not okay that I went through what I went through. It's just not whenever I went to speak up and say, this is painful, this is hard, this isn't okay, why, why do you act this way? Why do you treat people this way? Why, what is this and why? The answer I got was, you should just be grateful. You will never know what abuse is. You will never know what trauma is. What I lived through is way worse than what you've lived through. So just cowboy up, suck it up, buttercup. 
pull up your big girl panties, move on, get over it. No family is perfect. As soon as you find a perfect family, let me know. Quit your complaining. You should just be grateful. Some version of all of that was the answer and the response I got whenever I tried to say, that hurts. Why do you hurt me? Why? What did I do? Why? What could you possibly gain from being mean to me? Right? I know now that I'm worth it. I'm worth it. I'm worth driving. I'm worth the money that I'm spending on all this. I'm worth the years and years and years and decades that it's taken me to heal. I'm worth it. And so are you. So are you. Somebody needs to hear that. You can heal. It's going to take a lot of work. And I'm not saying that it's going to take you decades. And I'm not saying that you need a trauma-informed therapist. And I'm not saying you need to journal every day and learn about emotional intelligence. And I'm not saying you need to do all these different courses and silence your inner critic and do all these repetitions. And I'm not saying that you need to cut off your entire family because they're toxic and abusive. And I'm not saying you need to do what I did. But I'm telling you that if you do need to do those things, you're worth it. And that it's worth it. My life is so much more full and beautiful and enjoyable. You can't tell right now because I'm crying and having snot run down my face in front of everybody on, um, on camera. But I'm telling you it's worth it. Like, And I'm worth it. I'm worth it. And I might have to tell myself that like maybe, I don't know, a hundred thousand more times before I actually believe it. But every week I show up here and every week I heal just a little bit more. And every day when I journal or I maintain that healthy boundary or I cultivate that safe relationship or I practice really good self-care or I go to therapy or I interact in a safe group or I do one of our daily calls or I make a video or I put together a program or do something every day that I do something. I prove to myself that it's all worth it. I'm helping a lot of people and I'm helping myself as well. And it's taken me 40 something years to actually realize that not only is it possible, but I'm worth it. So healing is so worth it. It takes a really long time depending on your trauma because in example A that I told you about earlier when the person was raised in the good enough home until they were 17, That could possibly, that type of complex trauma that went on from age 17 on to about age 35, the client that I described to you, that type of complex trauma heals faster than someone who had extreme trauma from perhaps in utero perhaps early childhood, infancy, preverbal, extreme neglect. Um, it's just going to take a little bit longer. But regardless of how long it takes, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. I can't even describe to you in words how worth it it is. And you guys are worth it. If I can sit here and... I mean, I've been probably on this healing journey now for about 18 years. It's been hard. Some days are harder than others, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. 
So I hope that that makes sense and helps you. I hope this serves you. Nexus says, I have been stuck with CPTSD for years now. I cannot seem to get past my triggers and they seem worse now than before. In a way, I ain't living life because of it. Is there any hope? There is hope. I promise you there's hope. You can't tell because I'm like, have snot running down my face and I've been crying a little bit, but there's hope. I promise you there's hope. There is hope. Um, if your triggers seem worse now than before Nexus, I would want for you to ask yourself what is going on in your life right now. No, ignore that. If your triggers seem worse now than they did before, I would look at and I would journal about this or write it down. What was your life like before over here, like way back, like over here? way over here back here before when your triggers weren't that bad and then what is your life like now and what are some things that you can identify in your life back then versus now just on the topic of levels of toxicity in people and you don't even have to get deep on that I would simply look on the surface at people who tend to be um, manipulators. If you have more people in your life right now that are really manipulative, even if they do it in like a funny or a seemingly harmless way, manipulators are triggers for people who have endured severe complex trauma. So, I went through different periods of my life when my triggers felt much stronger than they did in previous years. And when I look at those areas of my life, when I was feeling more triggered, it was due to the fact across the board, I was allowing people to consume me and consume my time and my emotional energy and I wasn't feeling like I was able to establish and maintain a healthy boundary with them because if I said no to them they might reject me and cut me off and not be in relationship with me so Nexus I would ask you during the period of your life when things hurt less and you had fewer triggers, I would simply look at the number of people in your life that cause you to give more than you want to give or who are maybe not being respectful of your boundaries and the way you can notice this in your life nexus is if you have kind of an internal mm -mm, no, but you end up saying yes because you don't want to lose the relationship. You have a fear of losing the relationship. And let me know because if that's not the case and you're like, nope, that's not it, Athena. That's not it. That's not it. I'm looking at my life right now and I'm realizing that my triggers are worse now than they were before and I don't have what you just described. And if it's different than that, let me know because um, I would be shocked. I would be shocked if it didn't have something to do with interpersonal crossing of boundaries. Remember, an internal no Matching an external no is a healthy boundary. An internal yes, matching an external yes, that's a healthy boundary. When the two don't match up, that's when our triggers show up more and things start to feel worse than they did before. 
So I hope that was helpful. Let me know, please. Desi Pink says, neuroplasticity is essential to recovery. Yes. Rewiring the brain so we can actually make progress. But so many of us have trouble sleeping. Does this stall or halt the process? Does this stall or halt progress? Since neuroplasticity is hardwired in during stages three and four of sleep, according to my neurologist, such an excellent question, amazing question. And I have a two pronged answer for you, Desi Pink. First of all, I say this to you probably almost every week, but I do believe that you're a lot farther along in your healing journey than you're giving yourself credit for because you don't really begin learning about neuroplasticity and seeing neurologists and actually taking good care of yourself until you've really mastered the art of believing that you're worth healing. And so sometimes it takes survivors 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years to believe that they're actually worth going to the doctor and seeing a neurologist or looking at sleep patterns or reading the books or doing the things. So the fact that you even know what neuroplasticity is and you understand that it is pertaining to rewiring the brain and that when the brain is at its most neuroplastic state is during stages three and four of your sleep pattern. And if you have disrupted sleep patterns, then this can uh, pause the progress that you would make in neuroplasticity is just, it's amazing. First of all, like this is my cowbell that I ring during our daily calls when something amazing happens. So plug your ears right now or take your earbuds out if you have earbuds in because I just have an undeniable urge to ring my cowbell because this is huge, okay? So take your earbuds out, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for humoring me. I just got 12 thumbs down on this video because people hate loud noises, but I did warn you. The answer is a two-prong question, two-prong answer, Desi Pink. Yes, your sleeping patterns being disrupted will slow down your progress for neuroplasticity <clears throat> and your healing. And we need to find a way for you to sleep through the night. But two, the second prong to this answer is that if you find a really, really, really good somatic experiencing practitioner, uh, go search on somaticexperiencing.com and look at Peter Levine's work because it's just amazing. Um, you can also go on Bessel van der Kolk's website. Um, he wrote the book, Body Keeps the Score. He has some work that he does in Boston, some different retreats and so forth that really help. Um, but honestly, neurofeedback, somatic experiencing, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. These all help with neuroplasticity. These all help rewire your brain and create new neural pathways so that when we're triggered and we go to that space that we always go to, that is the triggered space, grass begins to grow over that road. And we don't take that road because we've created a whole new road that we end up going to, which is a road that is not a trigger road. It's just a, oh, look, I'm just like, it's like nothing happened. It's just like the same as every other road. It's not a trigger. So, um, but my goal, if like, if I was someone that was working with you, I would find ways that I could really hone in on what is disturbing your sleep. What is causing your sleep disturbances? Um, if it's a temporary prescription for something to help you fall asleep, if staying asleep is the issue, then I would be I would be speaking about that. If medication is something that you're completely not okay with, there are um, herbal supplements. There are different teas, like tea that you can drink. Um, uh, upping your exercise regimen, especially um, cardiovascular exercise like before you go to bed, that has been known to help you sleep better. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. Like where you're at is truly amazing. And I really am excited and I would love to hear an update on like how you're doing seriously. That's awesome.
Vi says, what is the fastest way to heal? LOL. <laughs> I love you, Vi. She says, I've been healing since 2001. And I am, and I am still. That's a long time. I think it may be a lifetime as our most important time is our childhood. Question mark. Well, I too have been healing since 2000. We can just say 2001 because I never like the whole one-upmanship like vibe. I'm not trying to say, oh yeah, well, I've been healing for a year longer than you. So there. Um, so we'll just say I've been healing since 2001. How's that? So it's been 17, 18 years. It is a really long time. And if I had been focusing on trauma recovery the entire time, I would probably already be doing like super awesome. But let's be real. I was focused on other areas of healing. I had some other things that I needed to heal that I didn't know about. And the way a lot of people's healing journey works is, come on now, I'm just trying to set my phone down. Okay, so the way a lot of people's healing journey works is we do the trauma-informed approach that we talked about, which means this is the present day and then this is childhood. Remember, our hands are the same size, but we're ch like we're back here and we're in childhood, and so we look really small. And then up here, this is us now. So we have maladaptive coping strategies because of stuff that happened back here. So back here is our childhood, and it's crazy, and we have a lot going on, and it's really painful. We don't have a lot of rest and love and kindness and safety and we're not seen and heard and cared for and looked at and nurtured and just loved unconditionally. And so present day, realizing that all the Hallmark videos that go on and all of the television commercials and the people around us and the, the people and the things and the stuff and the church and the all the things and just community and life and, you know, family, family's all you got. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Hallmark holidays. Yay, everybody's perfect. Life is perfect. Oh, mom, you're the best. Hashtag mom. Oh, Father's Day. Oh, fathers are the best. Oh, Father's Day. Oh, you know, and oh, uncle so-and-so and cousin so-and-so. Oh, family reunion. Family's all you got. Blood is thicker than water. All the things, right? And so since those don't really match up, there's like cognitive dissonance. Like what these two don't match up. Like, 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 look at how big and weird this is compared to how small this is, right? It's like, mm, no. So what we do is we, we what, what's going on in the present day in adulthood when we're big is we drink alcohol or we do drugs or we smoke or we gamble or we thrill seek or we're promiscuous or we have social media addiction or we do video games more often than we should or we just escape, we numb, we stuff, we avoid, we numb, we stuff, we avoid, we numb, we stuff, we avoid, we numb, we stuff, we avoid. Why? Because all this stuff still hurts and it was never really addressed because family's all you got. Blood is sicker than water. Yay, Mother's Day. Yay, Father's Day. Right? So this is the stuff we heal first. We heal the petals on the flower and then we deal with the root on the flower back here. For 18 years, you haven't been dealing with the root. You've been dealing with the petals on the flower. Maladaptive coping strategies. We deal with the symptoms for the first 10, 15 years. And then we deal with like the root cause, which is interpersonal trauma, which may be intergenerational trauma, the gift that keeps on giving. And intergenerational trauma is deep, 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 especially because of the stigma attached to standing up to your family and using your voice and the loneliness that the potential loneliness that it can create in your life. And so it's terrifying to heal from that because you're like, if I don't have my family, who do I have? I have no one. OMG. OMFG, what do I do? So, Vi, you and I are in very similar boats. We might even be in the same boat, okay? And I'm telling you that it's possible. I'm telling you that it's worth it. I'm telling you that you're worth it. And don't give up, okay? Because if I'm not mistaken, you are a cancer warrior, 
you have kicked so many maladaptive coping strategies in the booty that it's insane to even talk about. You have healed so much. And now you're dealing with this stuff, the roots. So if you've dealt with all the petals on the flower, dealing with the root, those skills translate. You know, those skills, tra not all skills translate. If you work construction when you're a teenager and you go and work at an engineering firm where you're going to be sitting at a desk and you're going to be coding and developing apps, very few of your construction worker skills in childhood and teen years are going to translate. However, if you were in the military and you were working on a ship and you were learning about the ship and then when you're out of the military and you go and you get a job and you realize that part of your job is going to be perhaps helping captains, boat captains, learn about this or that, or you end up going and doing, you come here to Hawaii maybe, and then you end up working on one of the boats here. And some of the skills that you learned when you were in the Navy and the military, when you were on the ship, some of the skills translate. But see, when you're healing all your maladaptive coping strategies that you developed to numb stuff and avoid the pain that was not your fault, and you heal all these things, those skills translate. So now that you're dealing with the root, a lot of those skills translate. So it goes quicker. It's not going to be another 18 years. It can go quicker. You can heal at an exponential rate because you've developed a lot of the skills that are necessary to actually heal. And I believe that wholeheartedly with everything that I am. I hope that was helpful. Hunter says, how long before we can give a final forgiveness to our abuser? I have found anger continually reemerging, even though I have forgiven. Hunter, first of all, I'm proud of you. You've done so much work. And I don't know if I believe in like final forgiveness. Why? Because I don't, I'm not supernatural. I'm not, I'm human and I'm flawed. And I am bound by my human existence and my human brain and my human feelings and my human everything. And that means I'm not perfect. So I happen to know that you and I share our faith belief system is very similar. We both like to read the Bible. We both believe in God. So in my opinion, like if I'm, I'm speaking directly to you, Hunter, because I know that you and I we, we share similar beliefs. God is capable of forgiving. And it's just gone. Far as the east is from the west. Forgiveness. Boom. Forgiven. You're not reminded. You're not shamed. You're not condemned. You're not having it smeared in your face, you're forgiven. You accepted this gift of forgiveness. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I love this gift. I needed this gift of forgiveness. Thank you. It's the perfect gift. Wow. Thank you. It's your gift. It's yours, right? And God doesn't take that gift away from you because he's God and he's not jerk human like me. You know, I could be like an Indian giver and give somebody something and be like, I want that back. Like, you're not nice. I gave it to you because I thought you were nice and you're not nice. And so I want it back. I probably wouldn't do that, but I'm just saying for all intents and purposes. So I don't know that we as humans are able to forgive and then just be like, that's it. I forgive. I choose to forgive you and it's done. And I will always feel the way I feel right now, which is glad that I forgave you. Boom. Done. I am a finite being. I am not infinite. And I am bound by my human existence. Or as one of my friends says, this flesh tent that I live in, I reside in a flesh tent. And I'm stuck in this flesh tent. And... I don't know how to forgive once and for all. 
I believe in forgiveness and re-forgiveness and re-forgiveness and forgiveness is a choice and choices are free. Our free will choice shows up when it's going to show up, however it's going to show up. So I believe that not only is forgiveness a choice, but we're human, we're flawed. And even though we choose to forgive somebody, doesn't mean the pain just ma magically disappears. Um, I believe in re-forgiving. I have forgiven and re-forgiven certain members of my family dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, maybe even thousands of times. So if we're looking for a final forgiveness and we're looking to delete the anger completely, I don't know if that's a realistic goal. We could shoot for that, but let's be open-minded to maybe it would be okay if I'm not perfect. Maybe it would be okay if I need to forgive this person again in the future. And maybe it's okay that I'm human and I feel angry sometimes, especially when I'm dealing with the fact that I was abused and I didn't ask to be abused and I didn't abuse myself. It was perpetrated upon me and it wasn't my fault. And so those feelings that come up are really frustrating feelings. And since I'm human, you know, I'm doing my best. I want to forgive and I want to forgive this final forgiveness thing. But man, maybe it's unrealistic for me to believe that I'm like this infinite being that can be like, I forgive you. And like, I won't remember it ever. And I'll never be angry again. Like, I'm not sure that that's a realistic thing. And honestly, Hunter feelings, the feelings that God gave us all need to be felt. And so I'm not saying get stuck in anger and, and be an angry person. And I don't want a root of bitterness to grow in your heart and, choke out all of the beautiful growth that could happen in your life because bitterness and anger can do that. That's not what I'm wishing upon you. But I think what I'm rather saying to you is please consider the fact that you're human and you're young. And I don't know that there's ever going to be a one and done. I don't know that there's going to be like a final forgiveness and I will never feel angry again. I don't know if that's possible. And I'm not 100% sure if that's healthy. I mean, anger shows up in ways in my life that I wish that it wouldn't, but I also have very healthy anger towards certain things. And if it wasn't for that anger, I wouldn't be able to embrace the work that I'm doing in this community the way that I have. I'm able to get in touch with the anger that I've never been in touch with before just by helping other people and go, wow, that is like really effing wrong. Like that should never happen. What's going on? And then it causes me in my own quiet time or in my own journaling time to go, wait a second, I was really angry about these things that happened to these community members of mine. Why was I never that angry when it happened to me? I've never even been angry that it happened to me. And then I remember, oh, wait, I was. And then I tried to speak up. And then I was told that I should just be grateful because it could have been worse. That's right. Wow, that makes me really angry because that's wrong. <laughs> so, you know, and I don't want to ever stay stuck in that place, but at the same time, those are healthy feelings for us to have. So was that helpful? I hope that was helpful. Willow says, is it common to struggle in recovery with integrating the intellectual understanding and processing the emotional processing? Yes. <laughs> this is the last question of the night. Um, and uh, this is a longer video than I had anticipated, but it's been very healing for very many people. And I'm really grateful that you all are still here. Um, I've lost about half of you. There were 60 and now there's like, you know, 30 something of you. So it is natural, Willow, and that's because it causes such cognitive dissonance, right? So intellectually, like we know 
what's going on here, right? Let me let me make sure that I read the correct words the way you worded it. So intellectually integrating what it is that's going on is here. And then our emotions, which were actually born a long time ago, are like over here, like deeper, right? And when we read books and we watch videos and we listen to podcasts and we purchase online courses and we participate in live streams and we show up in groups and we go to therapy or counseling or we hire a trauma-informed practitioner. Our prefrontal cortex organizes all that information in a way that really makes sense. And the left hemisphere of our brain finds a lot of words and language for it. And meanwhile, back on the other two areas of the brain, in our in our reptilian brain and in our amygdala, feelings are felt and sensations vibrate. And memories and body sensations come up. And all the knowledge and all the words and all the language from the left hemisphere in conjunction with the prefrontal cortex. If the bridge is out from the left hemisphere to the right, or if words only make sense to one area of the three parts of our brain that we're talking about, then in order for the amygdala and the reptilian brain to heal and to not tense up and feel hypervigilant in our body, there has to be a body healing. There needs to be some sort of modality that includes physical movement or at the very least, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing because it's bilateral stimulation. Bilateral stimulation means that both the left side and the right side are being stimulated. And then they can talk with one another because there's movement. So it is common to read the books, look at the images, memorize the memes, listen to the podcasts, watch the videos, participate in the live stream, show up in the groups, go to therapy and do all the things and organize it all and find words for it and have it not quite land to the point where our bodies feel safe. It takes a little bit of time for the two to connect and to gel. And it happens quicker with somatic experiencing and other body work, trauma sensitive yoga, expressive modalities that utilize both hemispheres, um, particularly when you stimulate the right the right hemisphere of your brain. So expressive modalities like art therapy and that type of thing. So um, I hope that was helpful. That was the last question. We ran way over. Poppy says, damn straight, you're worth it. <laughs> Thank you, Poppy. Um, you guys are amazing. Thanks so much for hanging out. I always enjoy... Um, leading these calls and serving this community, please head to cptsdfoundation.org if you want to get plugged in to anything, a free group, daily calls, which are affordable, um, a book club where we're going through books about trauma and healing. Um, if you want to learn more about going on a self-care cruise and that's like a year away, but at least we're planning for it. You know, there's going to be like payment plans and so forth. So um, cptsdfoundation.org, just click around and find whatever it is that you're looking for. If you're looking for a free group, 
if you're looking to be live on those daily calls with me, you know, click there. If you're looking to be a part of the book club, that's super affordable. It's like, I think it's like $5 a month. Um, definitely get the support you need. This is all trauma-informed peer support that I'm talking about, right? Um, I'm not a licensed clinician. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not any of those things. Um, but I am able to share my experience with you from a lived experience perspective. And I'm able to tell you what's worked for me and what's worked for a lot of our community. I really want you to know that no matter how long it takes to heal, it's worth it. You're worth it. And the PS at the end of all of this, like if you fast forwarded to the very, very end and you just want to know the answer already, like how long does it take to heal? Because that was the name of the video. Hello, Athena. Um, it's going to depend on how early your trauma began, how long that trauma took place, and the different modalities that you're taking part in, your ability to be fully present in your body, how healthy are your boundaries with all toxic people, and how safe are your relationships? How safe do you feel in your body? Are you able to feel seen and heard and loved for who you are, accepted unconditionally? Cultivate those safe relationships, establish and maintain very healthy boundaries with 100% of the toxic people in your life, regardless of the outcome. And just be patient. Be patient with yourself because you're worth it. Okay? You guys are worth it. And um, I've enjoyed this very much. I will see you back here, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, every single Monday unless I see you over on the daily calls, which are every single day, 365 days a year, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. So um, thanks so much for being here, you guys. I will see you soon.